evening, everyone. I call the Brandon Select Board to order for April 25th. Thank you all for attending, whether here in the room with us or folks by Zoom. Thank you for attending tonight as well. First item is always uh, agenda adoption. Is there a motion regarding the agenda that was posted? I'll make that motion. Mr. Coolidge moves to adopt. Is there a second? second from Mr. Wyman. Any changes to be made to the agenda before we adopt it? Can I request to add a 7A for the police cruiser? 7A regarding police cruiser. Purchase. Purchase. The possible purchase, how you can do it. Yep. 7A <coughs> police cruiser purchase. Discussion. Anything else to change? Add? Okay, if not, all in favor of adopting the agenda as it was just amended, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? That was unanimous. Awesome. Item two, approval of the board minutes from April 11th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Exactly. Motion from Mr. Markowski and second from Mr. Coolidge. Any discussion, any errors or omissions in the minutes as they were presented? All in favor? I have one. Yes. Um, I was on Zoom. I wasn't in person. Oh, would you make that edit, please, Charlie? Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm looking at the rest of the list. The rest of the list, I think they were here. Yeah. Um, anything further? All in favor of adopting and improving the minutes as they were just lightly edited, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? Aye. Mr. Wyman abstains. Item three, the town manager's report. So we have a, a written submission from the acting town manager, and we have the Natalie attired uh, <laughs> permanent town manager here. Uh, yeah, I added a few things on to um, the ATM's report. That, well, because there are things that happen. So, um, so <laughs> I'm going to start with the things I've added on. Um, we did receive the Class Two paving grant for Arnold District Road. Um, oh, that has been. The amount went up from 175 to 200,000, uh, so that's good news. Um, I'm hearing from V Trends that so far asphalt prices haven't gone up too much, so we might be okay this year. Um, the other thing is, I uh, on Arnold District Road again, the culvert. I actually met with the landowner that lives on next to the the culvert that we're looking to replace to go over temporary easement. We just have to get in the in the, the brook there a little bit and do some. Uh, you know, some river, diverting of, of the brook a little bit when we do the project. So, so met with them, they were really... The east side of the road? Yes. Um, very supportive of the project. Actually, the other owner across the road came over and we all chatted. Um, They're excited to see that uh, get replaced. And we did discuss, you know, that we're looking at hopefully closing down that section of the road for the project. And they were very happy with that as well. So. Um, that was good to hear. Nice that they're, you know, really in favor of seeing that get done. So now to the acting town manager's report. Um, Mr. Moore says the highway department has been busy with spring cleanup, and then pickleball at Nesheby School will commence on Sunday, May 1st, from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, May 7th is Green Up Day. Join Jim Leary, Green Up Day coordinator, at Central Park to pick up bags and give instructions on where to bring them after being filled. Um, May 14th is Nesheby Kindness and Safety Day. A multi-organizational collaboration to bring folks together at Nesheby School from 12 to 4. Nesheby PTO, Brandon Fire, Brandon Rescue, Brandon Police, Brandon Area Toy Project, Brandon Area Bike Association, and Brandon Rec will have many family-friendly displays, along with food, music, and fun, annual Omia Helmet giveaway, the Boyce fa Family Sponsored Bike Safety Course, and the Brandon Area Bike Association Bike Tune-Up. Um, and that's all I have for the reports this evening. Very exciting. Um, any questions for the town manager from the board? For either of the town managers, acting or <laughs> genuine, authentic. Oh, oh, any, any questions for the town manager from the public who are in the room tonight? How about from folks on Zoom? Any questions for the town manager? OK, not at this time. We'll go ahead along. Uh, item four is public comment and participation. So this is an opportunity for us to talk.
talk about anything that's not on the agenda that you would like to bring before the board. And there's always public comment available on every agenda item before and after a vote. So uh, we'll start with the board. Anything that's not on the agenda you want to bring up? Nope. Nope. From nope. Nothing. Nothing here. Folks on Zoom, anything that you'd like to bring up before the board that did not make the agenda? Not seeing anybody on Zoom. Okay. And folks in the room tonight. Bill Moore. I'd just like to remind folks that just got done with the uh, special district meeting for the uh, Otter Valley Unified Union School District that tomorrow the polls are open from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. to vote for the school budget. There's only one person from the public in attendance at that meeting, so just want to make sure people understand that uh, there's voting tomorrow. So Bill, Bill Moore is reminding us uh, he just came from the school district meeting, and Brandon voters can vote at the American Legion from 10 o'clock in the morning <clears> until <throat> 7 o'clock in the evening tomorrow. This is the uh, school budget question that... Um, did not pass on town meeting day. Anybody else? Great, thank you, Bill. Um, so vacancies on the planning commission, there are two, and I'm just announcing them. I don't have the terms uh, from Elaine. I think one is longer and one is shorter, but if anybody's interested in serving on the Brandon Planning Commission, please let your, make your interest known to Mr. Atherton, the town manager, by calling him or emailing him or seeing him at the town office before you put it in writing. Item six is to appoint a Brandon representative to be on the Rutland Regional Planning Commission for the remainder of the term that ends June 30th of this year. Um, I see a note here that Jack Schneider is willing to do this. I am willing. Thank you, Jack. Um, and this is to take place, Mr. Atherton? Correct. Thank you. Thank you for your past service there. Sure. Are, you are you still going to be on the uh, transportation Still on piece? transportation, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. I just so am I going to be acting, or am I? No, no. I, can, I can notify the RPC that you're just taking my spot. So okay. I just figured it would be a better position for someone that's on in the planning commission to be our planning rep or commissioner. That's a good line of thought. Jack is on the Brandon Planning Commission, and this would... Uh, put a planning commissioner from Brandon on to the Rutland Regional Planning Commission. What's the pleasure of the board? Make a motion to appoint Mr. Schneider. Motion for Mr. Wyman, a second for Mr. Markowski. <coughs> Any discussion? Any Great. public comment? Yeah. Grateful that you're willing to do the work. Yes, thank you. I've been to a couple of them, and uh, I find them interesting, but not enough to go regularly. Not a lot of work involved, really. They have good staff. They do. They do. They get a lot of stuff done. When they meet in person again, they feed you too, so that's kind of a bonus. <laughs> so yes, thank you, Jack, for, um, for doing welcome. this for the town. All in favor of appointing Jack Schneider, Rutland Regional Planning Commissioner, for the term ending June 30th, 2022, say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Item 7 is Brandon Energy Commission, uh, sorry, Brandon Energy Committee for a discussion about SolarFest and some information about community solar as goes with ARPA funds and for the results of some research about electric police cars. So I see two at least planning commission, planning com energy, energy, energy committee energy. members here tonight. Um, can I turn the floor over to you and you can handle sure. this how you want? Sure, uh, I guess you started with uh, SolarFest. They're having a Their first June 4th open house for uh, their main supporters. This is Jim Emerson talking for those financially uh, financial supporters and other uh, volunteers and key people, and including several uh, members of the this com present company. Um, they are. It's going to be to uh, explain their game plan for what they're going to be doing in the current year as well as coming years. They have. Uh, they're in the midst of. Just working that out as they get, um, I think on May 9th, they're getting a update on their wetland survey and so forth, so they will be able to define a little more clearly what, how they can use the, the uh, land. Um, they have uh, invited Dave to come share a few words <laughs> of welcome, if he would, if he's available on June 4th. 
from sometime between 11 and 1. There'll be a time specified as to when that segment will come. We appreciate your coming to offer a few words. Okay. Uh, we have also been kind of brainstorming about some things we could do. Uh, I understand from some recent communication with um, Seth and, and apparently the whole board that it's probably not fitting for this committee to go out and say um, solicit businesses to give say a discount for their their fall event which they're planning um, you know for example there's uh, hotels and bed and breakfasts and campsites and eateries and so forth but um, I and I understand that it's probably not a fitting activity for uh, this committee to undertake uh, but I do want you to know that as a citizen of the town, I intend to do that on my own. So that not to, so it's clear that I'm not overstepping any recommendations from uh, And, and that was just my individual um, response. Well, it makes sense. So, you know, it makes sense. We don't want to set a precedent that can uh, be problematic. So uh, the, um, and so they are planning an event, I don't remember the date in September, I think the 7th or something? I think it's the 12th. The 12th. I'm not sure. Okay, the, so the first, I think, or second Saturday of the month, they're having a one day event instead of their typical Friday through Sunday event. Um, just because they have so much they're pulling together. And they're forming, formulating that now as to how they'll, um, what, what it will entail in terms of speakers and music and other festivities. So that's so. Just to clarify, so yes. June fourth is an event to kind of they're inviting. I think about fifty people, many of whom are from out of town. And that's to kind of celebrate the fact that Solar Fest is is coming to Brandon in the. the that, yes, and, the, and that they're acquiring that whole uh, property, yeah. and you know the pieces are. They um, want to also show it to a lot of their major supporters. Yeah. And the September twelfth event is, is the it? actual Solar Fest, which is usually in general. July. Okay. But they're not going to be ready, so they pushed it to September of this year. Okay. Awesome. Thank, thank you for asking those questions. Um, any, and at the, at, we were certainly welcome to suggestions on how we might welcome them. Um, if anyone has any great suggestions, we're uh, wanting to make sure that I, I think they can have a very substantial uh, positive economic impact on the town, uh, among other things. Thank you, uh, Jim, for that. So. Uh, Thoughts from the board or thoughts from the public about any element of Solar Fest, either welcoming them here in June or um, about their event, their their actual Solar Fest itself that's planned for September. Yes, Bill Moore, Economic Development Officer. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, uh, to acknowledge the the hard work of the, uh, of the Brandon Energy Committee, um, by the way, specifically Jim Emerson and Jack Snyder. Uh, as well as Selectman Tim Giles, uh, and myself, it feels like it's been this really short sort of time, but they really sold hard and welcomed them with open arms and met with them many times, and I was able to back away from that and have the Energy Committee serve as a liaison for the town, and they did a good enough job, and, you know, obviously Brandon's an amazing space where people want to be on the town of Rutland County that gained population. I'll keep throwing that out there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that, uh, again, Solar Fest chose Brandon, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing. And it's going to be a big thing for our town going forward. So I want to make sure you acknowledge their hard work. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I would second that um, something like this doesn't happen just kind of because someone wishes it would happen. It happens because there's a lot of cultivation of relationships, and there's a lot of... Um, background work and research and consideration that goes into establishing a relationship and attracting something like this to a community. So, Jim, Jack, thank Bill, yeah. Dave, you all, I think, Jack, yeah. are. thank you yeah. all for, yeah. for doing that. And I, I did forget to mention they are planning an ongoing training program which uh, will help uh, train workforce to do heat pump installation and the solar installations and other weatherization programs. So they'll have a a year, hopefully a year-round presence um, where they can have in-class um, trainings as w and they have st staff for that and they've been conducting them in other towns uh, here and there to get their feet on the ground with that project and they will um, 
use the barn space for some of their hands-on uh, programs that don't uh, have to wait for good weather all the time. Sure. Yes, sir. I think, Jim, maybe meeting with Bill or myself or both of us and possibly the chamber director to discuss some or toss some ideas around on how to sort of welcome Solar Fest to town with, out, you know, without causing any sort of financial burden or anything to businesses. I'm sure that we can come up with something that everyone benefits from, too. I mean, sure. I think about, you know, when, when Bill has the carnival or, or things like that, like that, that attraction is to bring folks into town to hopefully stick around and walk downtown and, you know, do that yeah. other stuff. So I think that there's, there could be an easy way to market that, that we look at this as a good day for retail and yes. food vendors as well, so. Great, and uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I want to provide them over the banner saying, welcome to Brandon, home of the electric motor, and have it be a sign they can use for, for all their events to, but we'll talk about uh, how that fits into. That just triggered something in my head. So I know a while back, actually I got a call from someone at the state, I think maybe Representative Jerome asked about the Davenport Monument that's in Forestdale. So the town owns it. We own like this weird square piece of <laughs> land that it's on. Um, oh did a little research on that. So <clears throat> it does need a good, a yeah. good, uh, Yo, face good shining. So um, if anyone wants to volunteer for that, I will certainly find the cleaning supplies for them. Um, but it is ours, so um, we might want to pretty that up a little bit before yeah. Solar Fest shows up. We'll be glad to bring that to the Energy Committee okay. to suggest, and we also are hoping to do, as a side note, a, a little um, video of uh, to announce the uh, Davenport Fest, in which we hope to display Mr. Davenport's grave site and perhaps that stone, so it, uh, we hope that maybe we need to clean it up before that little yep. video. And yep. I, I went by it like two weeks ago and like, yeah, it is it's tired. a great place for people where they put their little dumpster toters out. <laughs> <laughs> Dump day too or something. Yeah, maybe we should put a little fence around it or something just to, you know, make it stick out a little bit more like the historic fire hydrant on Park Street, you know? Well. Representative Jerome has a comment. Yeah, just a couple of, um, <clears throat> pertaining to um, solar and energy and Thomas Davenport. I want to make sure everyone had received the Thomas Davenport resolution that was um, sent, that was signed by many, many members of the House of Representatives. And um, I'm presuming it's going to be presented at the at the um, EV Fest this summer in July. Is that correct? Yeah, Bill says yes. Oh, terrific. Okay, great. Yeah, and we had great enthusiasm from all the members of the climate um, Solutions Caucus, the, the folks who are really um, involved in um, trying to find a path forward for um, our climate. And then I also wanted to ask Jim about the, the trainings that Solar, the Solar Fest folks are doing, and if those are those trainings are resulting in a certification. Yes. Um, some, okay. Yes, they are. Great. And are you working with the local high schools to sort of advertise those opportunities so that kids who yeah. uh, might get a little additional training when they leave high schools for a better job? Yeah, Solar Fest is in touch with the key um, person at the high school that is involved with those kind of concerns. That's so right. Devin? Devin Carpack. Devin Carpack. So they've been coordinating with Ke Devin and uh, so to, to uh, work on a number of things, one of which is uh, this kind of training, and they're hoping that the high school students build some of the uh, bridges they need across some of the wetlands for the trail they want to put through the uh, Steinberg property they're acquiring. Yeah, things like great uh, match between what Devin Carpex uh, technology classes and perhaps Moose Lamu and, um, and workforce training. Ooh. So great, great. I, I work on... Um, largely on workforce and economic development issues, so I'm really pleased to see you um, going forward with this. It's great. Thanks. Thank you for the Musa Malu name drop. I will add that to their attention. <laughs> and thank you for the information about the resolution. I love resolutions, and I don't think the board has seen it. 
So maybe yeah. could I ask if you could maybe digitize it and chuck it on the town website or something and <coughs> email it to the town to the. Uh, so there's a, a copy has come to the town and another copy went to the museum. Okay. Well, let's make it more accessible. If we could. Sitting on my desk, you can grab it anytime. Yeah. I, we were gonna, I don't pick stuff up yet. We were going to hang it up in the town office, too. So I didn't know what the intention was, if it was going to be read at one of these festivals or not. So I didn't really want to rain on their parade if we read it in the slice board. <laughs> it was a great opportunity to, to educate um, many people, the 150 members of, of the legislature, too. Uh, or the, the house about Thomas Davenport, and it, they, many, 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 many people did not realize that um, the electric engine had been invented in Vermont, and it's certainly not, they didn't know that it had been invented in Brandon. So it is a nice um, little piece of PR for, this, for the state and for um, Brandon about this really, really super important um, invention that Tom, and the impact that Thomas Davenport, Thomas Davenport made on um, the world, really. That's great, and I was also largely really surprised when I was in when I was researching the historic site in in Forestdale. The the folks who run the historic site, hire historic markers and historic sites in in, in Vermont were knew about it, knew where it was, knew exactly what it was, but they had also had no idea who owned it or who took care of it. So it was kind of a little interesting um, short project that I was working with with Pat um, Wood, and I'm glad that. I'm so I'm glad the town owns it, and I think you're right. I think it needs a little bit of love and a little bit of um, focus on it because it's going to get a lot of attention this summer. We had asked uh, Kevin Thornton to actually draft the proclamation, which he had done with the right number of whereases and, and a therefore. <laughs> yeah, and he worked, he worked closely with it with the folks in the house who do that, and um, it was a very interesting process. Thanks. Perfect. Just Hilariously enough, uh, Jack read my mind. I just want to make sure that uh, Dr. Thornton, Dr. Kevin Thornton, our resident historian, Brandon Lover, extraordinaire, is uh, he's done so much work, so put so much time and effort into you know making sure Davenport's been risen to this level of of, uh, of acclaim, I guess. And and so I, I don't think you know you can mention Thomas Davenport around here, especially now, without mentioning the work of Dr. Thornton. You know, so many hours. I think he just got back from D.C. In fact, doing some uh, some research as well. So, yeah, he's in the back room of the Smithsonian, looking at the original motor that Davenport built. Oh, um, wonderful! Yeah. <coughs> Very cool. Anything else to be said about Solar Fest or Davenport? If not, we'll go on to the second part, which is community solar from the Energy Committee. Uh, yeah, hey, Sam. Yes. Can you guys answer the chats that are out there? Oh, sorry, we don't have it. We have a list, but he will open up the chat. Chat Thanks. says, where is SolarFest well, taking? First of all, it says SolarFest question mark. So, so they, what location it. is it at is what he's asking. It's on Steinberg Road between Steinberg Road and uh, 73. And for people that don't know where Steinberg is, as you're heading north out of Brandon and you go past the flower shop and the Jiffy Mart there or whatever it is, the, the, the little Mart store, it's the first road on the left going north on Route 7. That's Steinberg. It's all the land behind the community health center there. Yep, the land behind the community health. That's where Solar Fest is taking place in September? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a 60-acre okay. parcel. And, and okay, actually, thank you. the access will be off of 73. I believe so. Yeah, and because the, the property extends down to 73 and up to Steinberg. Um, and it actually doesn't... I don't, yeah, I don't, it does touch Route 7. It does touch Route 7 some, but that won't be where solar... Yes, yeah, it's too uh, wet there. They're, yeah. they're not going to be right on 7. They're hoping to use the land right around uh, the community center to plant sunflowers. <laughs> they're working on that. Some very inventive ideas. Thank you, Jan, uh, for reminding us about the chat. Is there anything else in the chat? No, that's all. No. Uh, the, the solar press. Oh, oh. oh, please speak up. Okay. Did we cover things? Yeah, we covered things. Okay, um, then we'll move on with the Energy Committee and Community Solar and ARPA. 
Okay, well, the idea of community solar is a uh, subset of this discussion. It was primarily, uh, we're introducing the idea of a, uh, using ARPA funds for, the, for a solar project. Um, the immediate suggestion would be to uh, dig into the possibility of using the landfill, the land on Corona Street, the um, landfill, the, the power service to the landfill is a single phase, so it limits the project to a 150 kilowatt system. The um, 150 kilowatt system needs somewhere near an acre of land a solar system cannot be on too steep of a slope. So the available land at the landfill is primarily on the crap top of it, which is close to an acre. Now it happens to be that um, if it's deemed to be far, you know, less than an acre, uh, we've been talking to MHG Solar who are we've visited with here uh, with their proposal for the 15 acre site on uh, Steinberg for their 2.2 megawatt system. They have these, uh, their standard approach to solar is to install uh, panels that tilt east and west. And they're, I don't know if it's 50% more efficient, but they are more efficient and need less land. So it might be a worthwhile approach. The other thing that they, NHG Solar recommended is using, um, you, you need a, what's typically concrete platforms to anchor these because they're subject to wind currents of some substance. They recommend using the stone cages with loose stone in them as more economical and more environmentally friendly than concrete. So that's a wonderful suggestion they offered. Um, we, the information we had to pin down what it might cost, Aegis Renewable Energy uh, let us know that they built a 150 kilowatt landfill um, system in Heinsberg for $497,000. That was uh, two and a half years ago. SolarFest, oh, so, I'm sorry, um, MHG did a back of the thumb, back of the envelope calculation saying they could see it costing as little as 375000 but with the current supply chain issues, with the fact that um, America is saying we're going to restrict or tariff um, Chinese solar panels, it could cost double, you know, uh, the supplies could cost double. I mean, they just don't know, so they put in a buffer number of 525000 for such a system. The uh, material prices are very unpredictable at the moment. Um, I sat down and calculated all the kilowatt hours used on the 17 accounts that aren't tied up with um, street lights in town. It comes out to be 450 kilowatt hours. The... Uh, 150 kilowatt system would generate about 235 kilowatt hours. 235,000 kilowatt Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, but the town already has a commitment with um, Green Lantern for about 320 kilowatt hours a year, meaning there's a need for 95,000 roughly uh, at, the, and at, at the current time. Uh, this ex the excess could be uh, made. You could, the arrangement could be made to use the have the excess run to the water department to the fire district, which has a substantial need for. Uh, we we uh, guess we have a estimate, maybe a guesstimate of over 200 kilowatt hours is their need per year based on their electric bill. Um, or it could also be used as a community solar that would serve businesses and other members of the community. And thus, uh, the town would benefit from the uh, excess production. So this would help the town meet its goals for uh, renewal, relying on renewable energy as, this, as we've tied ourselves to the state goals. Um, 
as the town moves more towards things like EVs, electric vehicles for the police car fleet, the, um, the current fleet is using 55,000 to 60,000 miles on their fleet of cruisers or cars now. That would take about 20,000 kilowatts a year that you could get basically for free once this investment is made. That's a much higher rate of savings than the cost of the electricity you're saving. It's like three times as much as you would, maybe more. Now, there could be hitches with solar on a landfill that we can't anticipate. Plan B, maybe it's plan A, Solar Pest is intending to put a substantial community solar project on their land. They expect to have a proposal out in the next three to six months that will specify the cost benefit. <coughs> they are confident it would be more cost beneficial than doing our own separate project because when you go from a 150 kilowatt system on a landfill to a 500 kilowatt system, for example, there's a big leap in cost savings. You use fewer inverters because you use heavier duty or inverters and there's other nuances I couldn't uh, recite. So it's something we should um, be holding as an option to consider over the short, you know, the next quarter, couple quarters to decide which would be the best approach. You could perhaps, with the community solar, tailor the need to just what the town's demands are now. So, um, my uh, dollars and cents of it, 235,000 kilowatt hours would save about 45,000 a year. There's cost for insurance and some maintenance, uh, probably under 4,000, but call it four to five. Save, net savings of four, four, uh, 40000 a year expected. Maybe they will offer some of this power to the fire district at a discount. Or I mean, That 45000 40000 a year net would go to the benefit of taxpayers in this town, whether it's through the fire district or through this entity. And uh, so we think that's a very worthwhile consideration. We would appreciate and the board, the, the, me, the energy committee recommends the select board set aside half a million dollars in ALCA funds for this until a number can be pinned down on what the actual cost will be. And we believe that savings of roughly 40000 could be used to pay for a bond that would cover even greater uh, project costs for other important uh, items than the town has on their list. Any questions? Thank you, Jim. Yeah, questions for Jim or comments for the Energy Committee. Mr. Atherton? So I had a brochure that I don't know if I gave to Tim or maybe you about the landfill and how we could use put solar on there. Because the landfill has a clay cover on it, we, the, we can't go and I think I gave it to you some time ago. We talked about it. Yeah, I, had a, I got all kinds of information on what we can and can't do up there. And like the solar would have to be sort of a flush mount type system that we could not penetrate that. Yeah, that yeah, that's why they put these concrete but anchors of uh, that do, don't penetrate into yeah. the soil. But if you if you don't have a version of that, I should find one to give it to you because it's yes. pretty explanatory. Yeah, the, the Bristol um, uh, solar uh, was recently done on the landfill site. It had the same issue, no. and what they end up doing is 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 putting boxes down. Of, it either gets made out of concrete or out of stone. Mm -hmm. and, and it's totally on the surface, which means at any time you can take the solar down and pull it away and you just have your landfill there again. And so, right, that's exactly what, what you're yeah. referring to. Do you think? Oh, I was going to ask, did we ever get a definite number as to how much ARPA fund we have left? I know we did some, uh, the fire district for the connection. It was like 400000 to the sewer pump. I don't have the... I sent that out to you guys. Um, I mean, five, I'm, I'm just doing quick math, but 500000 would 
eat up probably ninety percent of what we have left. Well, we've spent a hundred and twenty-five up to one hundred twenty-five for the fire district one and two connection. Yep. Um, there was four hundred thousand for the sewer pump. But as you pointed out, that was supposed to be a fifty-fifty. It so was until well, that was what you understand. Seven hundred thousand dollars. It's a four hundred thousand dollar pump system. Yeah. Or there was three hundred sixty thousand. So there's there's call it five hundred thousand dollars right there. So another five hundred thousand would get us up to the one million. So we would only have five hundred thousand well, uh, yeah. left. Which, which was I'm not saying yeah. no yet, yeah, but yeah. Um, well, and in six months you, you would, or in the next three to six months, you, you could pin down what this number would be. It's gonna, right. gonna and then it would be a clearer decision. For us. So I'm just, I'm just trying to do quick math, and if we only have six hundred and sixty thousand or six hundred and sixty thousand dollars left mm -hmm. out of that ARPA funds, I mean, you know how much I was thinking I put up about. Giving you seven hundred thousand dollars for a pump station. Well, we know that's not the number. I know that's not the number, but that, that was a conversation right before. <laughs> yeah, I well, you guys know how I feel about this. I want. I'd love to see our projects get done that right. are at a crucial need. And um, well, I just I just don't want to I don't want to eliminate all of our upper funds on and not have enough to help ourselves with infrastructure. But how much, how much of a bond would $40,000... Uh, it's not really how we get to a bond. It's it, not like it's a down payment on a bond. No, no, I'm just saying if you had a bond and you had to pay $40,000 a year for it, what would be the size of the bond? For, we probably couldn't even get one for $40,000. Okay. I mean, if, so it, it, if you're paying... It means a $40,000 annual payment. Yeah. Would, be, would represent what size of the bond? I don't know. I don't know. I well, if it's over 20 years, it's... Going to be somewhere eight hundred thousand less interest. So well, we shouldn't be bonding for things that have not that don't last the term of what the bond is, though. You know, like I mean, yeah, bonding for sidewalks or paint or roads or anything is not a great decision to make because you're going to pay past the longevity of what you're putting in the ground. Yeah, th this is kind of getting into the, the next topic, because um, um, I think there's a lot of rich discussion around how to spend ARPA money and uh, how to use 1% money and how, much, how to bond and this kind of thing. But um, it okay. sounds like we were just getting yeah. a solar proposal from you um, in this part of the Yes. Well, I guess I, I don't understand like why we can't do it and why we can't talk to a solar company like we did with the project out on you know, Robert Wood Drive, where, you know, there another company is building the array. We're benefiting from rent and cost savings on our utilities and able to tax them. Like, why would we not want to enter into another agreement like that where, you know, we're getting, we're making money annually on our array just by having them there, even if we didn't take any you know, our 15% our of total output off of it. What I'd love to see is the comparison, because um, when I looked at um, Middlebury's uh, process that they went through to move into solar, they compared a Green Lantern option with an ownership option, and when they looked at the numbers, the ownership option created a much larger benefit, I mean, almost double over the, co over the lifetime of the, of the project. And so, um, well, I think the Green Lantern is great for the town. I mean, we save some money on, as you pointed out, we save some money on our utilities and we get to tax them and this kind of thing. Um, I, th I think the ownership, if we actually looked at all the numbers, would, would prove to be more um, yeah, beneficial. One, one thing that's happened in the past year since you, got, you entered that agreement with Green Lantern is that Green, you're get, we're getting a 15% discount on our electric bill. That is now 8% is what the typical and then seven percent so the discount is cut in half from what it used to be um, but your idea is great and that's what, one reason to take the solar fest option seriously it could be it would be a two hundred fifty thousand dollar or even less purchase arrangement last for 40 50 years 
and you would get the taxes for the whole project and you'd get the, uh, well, you wouldn't get rent on the land, but... Or another way to look at it is why don't we bond for the solar project and use ARPA to get our projects done. Right. Um, well, and it, I mean, if, if the solar's creating this, you know, annual income, then it's paying for the bond on its sort of well, self... Well, it creates enough to pay for the bond. Right. <clears throat> So if it's sort of self-sufficient, right. like, why, yeah. why couldn't we look at that approach instead of using... <laughs> I, I just want to get these projects yeah, yeah. done. Well, I, you know, I, I, but we're, we're not, we're not attached to that. Right? I, I want to get these projects done too. And I think it's an excellent question of how do we... Um, because we want all these things to happen. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to bond and ARPA and 1%? And, and, you know, I, I think if we, if we look at all of the different ways, and at this point we have lots of good options. I mean, for a town, we're really wonderfully situated with these, you know, financing options. And then, sure, let's figure out which is the one to bond and which is the one to ARPA. And well, and another thing I was thinking of too, and you guys can stop me anytime if you want, but I, you know, these have these these solar things in my head that go off all the like with with PD. If we're eventually going to electric vehicles, why don't we do an array of PD like on the roof? Well, I know Jack had mentioned something once about. Doing like a portico type thing where, and I think he's talked to our chief about it too. Like that seems to be another thing where that makes that whole sort of complex self-sufficient, and right. to, that seems to make the most sense to me because it's it's right that, there. That's certainly you know, a great option. And even if it's, it's great just option. panels to, to to charge the cruisers, I yeah. mean. It doesn't need a lot, apparently. I mean, you have... Well, actually, it, it's always going to be tied into the grid. Right. And so you're never going to have a standalone solar. It's, it's always going to be grid tied. So why couldn't it be? Why couldn't it be standalone? It, it, yeah. The Achilles heel of solar is the, are the batteries. It's like people that live off grid, that's the difficult part of the system. And mm -hmm. so we totally want to be grid tied. It's yeah. the least expensive and it's the most dependable. And... Um, and you get benefits. And certainly, you know, while we're, we're including this kind of conversation, the, the future town garage, which I, seems to be I just, just around the corner. You know, if we're talking about town garage, yeah. no better spot. To, yeah, you know, roof I, it in. I mean, it just seems like if it's if we have that area now where we can use solar panels on our what we already own, that kind of makes it makes sense to me that well, way. Then the landfill is the, is that too though, because we own that. The, the landfill. So I, I can tell you, like I did talk to Green Lantern about this a couple times with Dave Carpenter, who was the guy that took over um, our old guys. I can't think of his name. That was great. Um, Sam Carlson, um, and the concern was that three phase falls short of there, and that was the big thing that it just that's not cost effective. I think like. Jim said, like the smaller array, yeah. once you start going bigger, things become, you know, with what you need to do for equipment, it's a different thing. So that, you know, we've looked at that three or four times with trying to do something up there, and it just hasn't really, just hasn't seemed to have been like the best. That's how we ended up yeah. where we are with Green Lantern now. Um, but I did talk to Dave Carpenter like a year ago about the, the landfill, and that's just because of the no three phase being there, that was sort of the... The, the offset of, I mean, the virtue of the landfill is that to uh, generate a project that's larger, say, where's the land? You'd have to lease it, you know, at a cost to the project, and it may not, it, it deteriorates that gap between the somewhat. I mean, that needs to be evaluated, we sure. haven't... Uh, but I look like if we have, or already it, have roofs on, yeah. you know, our town buildings, it's like a great place to put solar on. Huh? It's true, but the, the scale of solar on a roof is like 40 to 50 kilowatts would be a lot. It's like, if you've seen Seth's barn, that's 10 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so even if we had a fairly large you know, um, garage for our trucks, you might get 40 or 50. But we're talking about um, needing to have... Um, 90,000, yeah. You know, a, a lot more solar and, and a lot more in the future. Because remember, we're moving more towards electric everything and so um, I think we're, we're for the next five years we're going to be looking for more places to put solar and at some point the, the landfill is going to, to be economically viable. My sense with the landfill was that Green Lantern couldn't make it viable because it was too small for them but that was because their model is they build it, they own it, they sell us the power where I think if we build it, we own it, it comes into a different um, benefit you know, a class.
and, and that's why I'd love to see the numbers. I, I'd love to see an honest um, <coughs> bid process where we say, hey, who can build this for us? How much is it going to you know, produce? How much is it going to cost? And some really hard numbers. And then, and then step back and say, you know, go, no, go kind of thing. Jim? All right. Other comment, questions? Folks on Zoom, anything to offer? I do, Seth. Yeah, Jen Cooley, So, thanks. when you're doing a comparison, you know, Tim said, like, the Middlebury option, they owned it, where currently we have one with Green Lantern, where we rent it or lease it. you got to remember who's paying for the cost in the end when it has to come down or it's obsolete or needs to be replaced. When you're renting it, those costs were built in for Green Lantern, not the town. So that's another big piece, you know, when you're looking at apples to apples and dollars in savings, that's a big piece you have to consider. Decommissioning uh, costs. Yeah. Well, right? yeah, according to, yeah, according to ACORN, the decommissioning costs are, especially for a landfill, are not particularly substantial in that the uh, concrete blocks or rock cages are reusable generally and the uh, steel is re recyclable and the panels themselves are now uh, recyclable so the the costs are they did a serious study of the potential cost and determined they're pretty modest you know, there, there is something in our green lantern lease and I'd have to look it up because I haven't looked at it in a while if the panels start to fail that they replace them so that's not on for how long on. It's quite a ways out. I mean, then we have like five-year renewables after. I think it's within a 15 or 20 well, years. Just to be clear, we're not leasing those, I don't think. I think we're allowed to no. use the power. They we own them. Right. The, yeah. They yeah. own the panels. We got 15% of the total output. Right. We own the land that it's on, so we got an annual lease payment, but for lot rent. Yep. And we got taxes from it. Yep. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just wanted Jane to understand that we're, right. we're not renting or leasing the Green Lantern ones. They're, they own their system and they're selling us power at a discount. Right, we're the landlord. And, and they, they, have to, they have to decommission it. Right. right. Yeah, but Jen's right because they make you put that decommissioning cost up front. Like it's, you know, when these certificate of public goods go through, that whole thing's already calculated in. Right. So. And you just have to compare everything not just, you know, the cost of what you're going to get, you know. Each piece has its own value. Other comment, other thoughts? Okay, so thank you for all that research on the part of the Energy Committee and the case for using some ARPA money toward a community solar project. I think that based on um, the direction that Mike was going and you know some information that we have got from the town treasurer Dave about previous board votes um, I think this will we'll just kind of keep moving in that direction of looking at the ARPA money the local option tax money potential bond money on the one side of the balance and then we'll look at all the projects that have been raised on the other side and see if we can make things gel together yeah. and that that uh, I think may may take some time yet but it sounds like um, with the community solar at least it sounds like from what you presented that it may be that four or five six months from now there may be yet another kind of concrete option, option yeah. to yeah. consider with community solar correct so maybe so we wouldn't really be it wouldn't behoove us to run into a community solar on the landfill right now I agree okay good I like agreement. I like harmony. <laughs> I like peace. Consensus. Right. All right. Anything else to be said on community solar? If not, we'll go on to electric police car research, which is another thing we asked the Energy Committee to do some research on, and they presented a little um, little report in the select board packet. But would someone from the Energy Committee like to talk about it? In I'd person? be honored. Is that you? All right, Jack. Thank you, Jack. And thanks for asking for our input. Uh, I think residents can be assured that we're following the green fleet policy, reduce uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but still deliver the required functionality in a cost-effective uh, way for using taxpayer money. 
So I'm not going to go over all four pages of the uh, research. I'll just hit a few of the uh, key points. And something to add, I went over to Thetford this morning because uh, Chief Kapitansky of Richmond was demoing his Tesla model for four different uh, police departments. Um, Woodstock was there, Bradford was there, uh, Thetford, of course. Uh, so I'll, I'll throw his comments in on top of this. The advantages of electric uh, vehicles, well, all the police like them because they're really fast. They, they're about twice as fast as 60 miles an hour as a gas-powered cruiser, certainly more so than the uh, charger that's in the garage. <laughs> um, there's very low fuel cost and virtually no maintenance at all. Uh, they, uh, Richmond got their police car last August and only got it fully outfitted in October. So they don't have a huge amount of uh, maintenance costs, but uh, the chief referenced a, uh, an Indiana police department that they were spending $7,800 a year on gas and spending $800, and that was gas and maintenance, and spending $800 on their EV. So right there, that was a $7,000 maintenance and fuel cost each year. Uh, Tesla claims they have some cars that are consumer cars that are going to be approaching a million miles. So uh, the chief in Richmond also felt that his uh, replacement cycle is four years. He's pretty sure that he's going to go six years or more. So right there, there's another cost savings because he has to put away, uh, you know, a certain amount of money each year in order to pay for the replacement. So, uh, in general, the research that we've seen is that there is a price premium for these EVs, but it gets paid back in 18 months to two years. It just depends on how fully you outfit the car. Uh, some of the uh, perceived uh, drawbacks, the big question always is the range. Uh, generally, he says he's getting over 300 miles on one charge. I have to fill up my gas car every 350 miles. Um, uh, Jim did some research with the department here. They only drive 40 or 50 miles a day. So it's not like we're going to, you know, you can go several different shifts without having to recharge. But what they do is um, they drive the uh, car home at night and plug it in. Jack, what was the kind of car that you saw today? It was a Model 3 Tesla. Tesla. Uh, there was some research done in Norway, which also has cold winters, and they found that uh, the Tesla model they were testing only lost about 20% of its charge. Uh, Chief Kapitansky says it's really more like 40%, but still 40% off of 300 is you know, quite a few days of, uh, of being uh, riding around uh, Brandon. Um, if you're a New York City Police Department or one of the other big cities, you add a lot of weight because you put in ballistic glass and bulletproof doors and things like that. They carry more equipment than probably our department needs. So uh, that the additional weight is not considered to be a really major problem for the Richmond Department. Uh, pris prisoner transport. The interior of both the uh, Tesla and the Ford Mach-E Mustang uh, is really too small to put a cage in. So, so what they have done is they took their, I think it was an F-150 truck, and they put a cage in there. And they use that when they have to do prisoner transport. And uh, the other negative was uh, low ground clearance. The chief said the car actually performed extremely well in snow does not do well in muddy roads. So if you've got a foot worth of mud, it's going to bottom out. So again, what they do is they just take their uh, Explorer or their truck when they need to go into uh, those areas. So we took a look at all the major car man manufacturers. Most of them, uh, Nissan, Toyota, um, they, they offer an electric model that's used for, for administrative kind of purposes and for school crossing guards. They don't use them for patrol. 
So the two big players in this field are Ford, which actually developed the police segment starting in 1950. And it's been a really good business for them. And they have almost two thirds of the market. And then the other big player is Tesla. So if you're going to consider an EV, you're probably looking at those two first. Um, a Dodge, which has a charger, the gas model is going out of service at the end of next year, I think. Mean. And they haven't really announced what they're going to replace it with. So they're probably a couple of years away at this point. So I think in terms of environmental reasons, or the cost of maintenance and fuel, uh, the longevity. You know, I think that an electric vehicle makes a lot of sense for the town of Brandon. Um, but there are a lot of supply chain delays. Uh, you can go on the Tesla website and order something, but it's not going to get delivered until at least October. And then because the difference between Ford and Tesla, Ford fully, completely outfits the, uh, the Mach-E Cruiser, if you want them to do that. So they can deliver a car and you're all set to go. Uh, Tesla, you have to find a retrofitter to add the lights and additional kind of whatever you equipment that you need to have in the, uh, in the police car. Uh, the one other mention that uh, the chief had was the Tesla and the Ford are really tight when it comes to a patrolman getting in there with their full kit. And the interiors are small, and when they're all belted up, it's not as comfortable a ride as you would like it to be. So he was thinking a couple of years down the road they were going to do a F-150 Lightning, although that's actually double the cost. So Tesla's, you know, fully loaded, come in around 60, 62. I think that's what uh, New York City uh, Police Department is, is going to pay for it. And the, uh, the Ford Mach-E comes in around 54000 but you probably have some add-ons there too. Uh, Chief uh, Kapitansky spent 52000 for his Tesla, and then he had to spend an extra 6000 6, to fully outfit it. So I think if you want to move forward with an EV, there's going to be a delay regardless. Uh, his comment was, if you're really not in immediate need for a police car, you may want to make, wait a year or so. Because they'll work out all the details, all the kinks. You know, big uh, city departments are going to get favorite treatment over smaller towns. So if we don't have to immediately make a decision, that's not a bad thing. So thanks for asking us. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack, and the Energy Committee for that. Thanks for the field trip today. That was a good idea. Um, questions for Jack or the Energy Committee? Or comments? Some really useful information in this. Yeah. yeah. If I may just add, I mean, yes, the Tesla does require some fit up. It's, hundreds of Teslas have been fit up. There's, you know, in this region, there are companies that do that fit up, so it's not, you know, like a, a difficult thing to accomplish, necessarily. It does take some time, and I, and, uh, anyway, we just want to reiterate the uh, principle of, uh, one of our, you know, the principle of reduce, recycle, reuse, uh, we encourage our, the idea of reducing buying a vehicle until you really, really need it. Uh, as far as demand goes, and when I looked at the you know amount of, t amount of miles these cars drive that are in the fleet now, it felt like that uh, there isn't a for my taxpayer hat on. It doesn't look like there's huge urgency to buy one right now for my uh, that limited perspective. Dave, uh, can you refresh us on? the current fleet that we have and staffing and stuff of that nature or ask the chief to do it? We have the F-150. We have two explorers. We have two Tauruses. And then we have those chargers. 
which one doesn't if one is out of service. So, um, was I right in remembering? Was your thought that both of the charges would be used to um, as trades? No. no, we're looking at one as trades, but the, the other one's ten years old. It would be disposed of, disposed of something. We, we would need to get rid of it. Okay. And, and what is our current staffing level? Hold on. So we have six. That's including chief. <clears throat> and that includes the, the, the. Does that include everybody who's out of the academy at this point? So these are people that recently graduated. Mm -hmm. So at this point, are we looking at getting rid of two chargers? One charger. One charger. And doing what with the other one? It's in service right now. Spare. So there was there this is kinda of off the energy topic, but stopping. There everybody still, everybody takes a car home. Right, right. But and we're still in search of a so chief has conducted a couple interviews for new candidates. One, one we passed on, and we have one that's going through the next steps. So. Okay, so after a new hire, we will have seven police officers. Yeah, I think that's all that's in the budget for this year. And we need to supply seven vehicles. That's how it is right now. You know, okay. the, the officer takes well, I, I, I'd love to have a conversation about that. Because I think, um, it, while it's true we've done that in the past, I, I, I think it would be reasonable to talk about whether that's a, a smart decision going forward. Well, I think we can, that's that's in our Actually, in the new contract, so the only really time we can change that is in a new negotiation next year, I believe, is when it's coming up. I'd like to explore that, um, because I, I think it's a mistake to, um, I mean, while we're getting into this conversation, I, I, I found some information from the University of Vermont Center for Research that um, talks about um, per capita uh, spending on police and the average per capita spending um, in Vermont for police is $62.91 um, and in Brandon we spent 220 That's more than three times the, um, the average. Um, and I don't think we have more than three <coughs> times the average um, dangerousness in our community. In other words, I think that it's reasonable to say, you know, what are some ways we can, um, you know, bring our police fund um, towards the average. And I think one way is to recognize that giving everybody a police card that, um, you know, when they're not on duty, it's sitting at home and not used and that's not true so because our officers are on call it is used and you know that was one of the benefits of coming to Brandon PD was that they could take the cruiser home you remember the last couple of years we've had a very small department that has been on call and worked multiple hours of overtime and had to respond from their homes which is why we let them take a the cruiser home the other thing too Tim was the cost for PD. The town in this room, I believe, made the town's people wanted full coverage, 24 hour coverage for the police department. There are a lot of towns that are part time. You know, the sheriff's department's eight to four. Um, towns don't have full time certified officers. It depends on where, what they want to have for a department. You know, like Bristol's only the village. They don't have, the police don't cover the rest of the town. That's covered by state police. Yep. So that's where the, the difference is and what is being financed for. That's what the town wanted. Well, we haven't had 24-hour coverage for quite a while. Oh, we've been pretty close to it with, this, with the small staff that we've had. I mean, they've been going till 2 a.m. and then the guy that I gets mean, off on I, 2 is I on call. I appreciate how hard they've tried <laughs> to cover it, but my understanding is that our coverage has been much less than 24. They've responded, and they haven't 
said call the state police and the sheriff's department. They right. responded in those 24 hours. Yes, and I appreciate their service. Um, I, I, I would also question how often we need to have people responding from their home when they could go to the police station and pick up a vehicle. Much the same way our ambulance drivers do. I mean, when our ambulance drivers need to go on a call, one of them, back when I did you know, ambulance work just 10 years ago, um, one of us would typically go to the scene with our car, and we'd just be there so we could be present. And the other person would go down and get the ambulance. And that had more you know, gear in it, and, and, um, and it was a great way for small communities to handle the needs. And I think when I think about the level of crime in our community, I think the need to like leap in your car and respond from your home and the difference of five minutes to pick up a car from the police station, I think we should be having our police pick up a car from the police station. Well, that's up to the select board to decide that. But I know <coughs> what the town's wanted and, and you know that's how they've been able to provide the coverage they have. Yep. And the response times they've had. I mean we don't run the rescue squad, so I don't I don't know how they staff their department. That's, I mean, that's a volunteer organization anyways. <laughs> and I believe when we did this, I believe it was a, one of the town meetings that the, it was voted to, or a poll and they wanted 24 hour coverage. So before you could do anything, I'd almost think that you'd have to go back and see what the rest of our community and taxpayers, if they want 24 hour coverage or do they want, and I, you know, I, I disagree with you some on that especially, and I always go back to the instance of the lady up in Leicester um, about when her husband got shot. Leicester doesn't have any coverage, they have to use state police coverage. I believe that our police department did go up to be there. There's nothing they could do. They were over two hours that lady had to sit there. Um, I don't really go for that for our residents around here. And that extra, somebody in Forest Hill would come down, get a car, pull it out, whatever. Um, and, and, we, and we've got it in our contract that they have a, that they have a vehicle to drive. Um, you, were, you know, we want, we want to build a home. We, we've talked about holding police and holding our sustainability on being able to keep people here. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things I think we're going to have to do. Well, but, but let's and, and let the voters let the voters decide on that later on. I, uh, I love the idea of letting the voters weigh in because I, I would love to have them voice an opinion on how much policing we need because I think that's part of what this conversation about whether we need another car. And I think the um, the question of retention is an interesting one because I've been told that the reason we want to have a car for every police officer is because it helps them you know, want to work for us because they have their own car. And that hasn't proved successful. In my, in my time here in Brandon, the last six years, the turnover has been immense. I mean, we are not retaining our police officers. We have one, uh, an incredibly young police force. Um, it's. Um, and, and, and thus, that strategy, I think, is, is not a valid strategy. Claiming that giving someone a car is going to um, keep them employed here has not worked. So I don't, think that's, I don't think that's a fair analogy either, though, Tim. You know, we have, we have people that got into PD and just decided they didn't want to do it, or they went to state police, which we'll never compete with. Um, you know, well, I think there's a lot of reasons people don't stay, but the idea that giving them a car is somehow a perk, I don't think proves to be true. So I think the big reason we met, we got away from the 24-hour coverage is the staffing issues, if I remember that conversation from, I think it was last year. Um, and now I think the magic number was seven police officers on the, on the force to be able to get that to maybe Chief <coughs> Pisto one of us can chime in on that, but I think there was a conversation even with uh, Chief Burkell at the time that I think seven was a magic number to get back to a 24-hour coverage, and if we're worn away from that now, we're... I, I, I'd be curious to know if seven police officers is going to give us 24-hour coverage, and 
Um, I seem to recall seven to twenty-four. I think it depends whether there's, whether there's two on a shift all the time, or whether there's one on a shift and one on a right. call, or you know those kinds of things. So there's all kinds of Zoom activity, though. Um, we have a hand up and a comment two in the hands chat. Up. Two hands up. Hands up. Yeah. Two people on the phone. Uh, Pete Welch. Is Tr Trisha Welch. <laughs> Yes, um, I just feel that we shouldn't be defunding the police. I think we should be buying a new gas one. They're down, looks like they're down two cruisers now. You can get one from G Stone. And then, as they said in the report, when they work out the quirks of the electric vehicles, buy one next year when you're going to get your money's worth instead of buying one now that already has some problems and you're still down a cruiser. So I think you should buy the gas one now and look at electric in the coming year. But we should be supporting our police. And I personally, if I have a problem and I call the police, I don't want them having to wait until they go through a snowstorm in the middle of January to get to the police station to get a car before they can come and answer my problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, Chief Kachajian. So, getting back to your question about staffing, um, right now, with seven, we're able to do 20 hours a day with officers being on call for four hours. Uh, prior to taking office, I believe there was uh, enough slots for eight. That position was uh, taken off the budget, so it would be extremely difficult for us to go 24 without an eighth officer. But that being said, we just switched our schedules to a 10-hour-a-day schedule where the officers are working four days on, three days off. So the town right now is getting 20 hours a day with officers on call for four hours. So that's actually, um, like I so said, we're almost right there. I'm actively trying to recruit officers to come work here. Um, getting back to the subject about the cars, I will say this, in this day and age, um, Branding needs to be competitive. Law enforcement is a competitive occupation right now, and you need to be able to compete with other agencies who are offering um, bonus sign-on bonuses, higher pay, better benefits. And if not, we are going to lose officers to other departments and towns and counties and municipalities who can supply these things. Um, we need to invest in our officers. We need to invest in good employees. I have a fantastic team here, and the town is extremely lucky to have them. Um, I don't want to see anything that would affect that. And like I said, things like take-home cars, not only is it a benefit for a lot of these officers who are younger, just starting out, and aren't making a lot of money right now with what they're being paid, um, it's definitely a benefit and something that will attract officers to come into the department. It's definitely a perk. Um, like I said, I wouldn't want to do anything that would jeopardize us being able to retain people um, but unfortunately, like I said, there's other departments out there who are hungry for young officers and they're willing to offer them a lot to take them away from our town so they'll have the coverage. So I'm, I'm just trying to be a realist here with that. Um, and it's not just Brandon. It's, if you look across the state, if you look across the United States, this is what's happening. So if, if we want to be able to retain these officers, uh, things like take-home cars, any, any little perk, will help us retain people, and, and, it, and it does work. I worked for agencies where that was a major perk to have a take-home car. And it also does affect response time. It, as the person that just mentioned earlier, if it's in the middle of a snowstorm and our officers have to drive to the station and pick up a car, those minutes could make the difference between life or death. It, it doesn't seem like it, but it really does. In my world, in police officers' world, uh, a matter of a minute or two could literally make the difference between whether someone lives or dies. So having to drive all the way to the station, even if we have officers who live maybe 10 to 15 minutes outside of town, uh, double that response time with a snowstorm or roads that are flooded out, you name it, and it could make a big difference. Thank you, Chief. So, Chief, um, you say we have 16 hours of coverage and four hours of on-call. What happens for the remaining four hours? 20 hours. 20 hours. He said 20 hours, but that's 16 hours and four hours on-call, you said? Or did you say 20 no, two, hours? Two, two, two. 20 hours. We have 20 hours of coverage right now where there's officers who are on duty. And then there's four hours a day where our officers are on-call to be able to 
uh, come in for an emergency. Okay. Uh, my goal, hopefully, is eventually to be able to get that extra position. If we can get us up to eight, we'll be able to go 24 hours. Mr. Chair, and yes, can I ask for like a, kind of a point of clarification here? Like, we're, nothing's on the agenda that says we're talking about police department or hours or defunding or whatever. Uh, like, well, so I, I'm wondering what, how. I'm going to. I'm tending to allow it because I think that um, that larger discussion informs. Uh, how the board members might consider voting on the electric police car research and or the next agenda item, which is police cruiser purchase. Okay. Um, uh, Jim Emerson. So, uh, if the need for the police car is deemed uh, appropriate to buy now, which I can accept, I would recommend that we allow, use the savings that you get from a car that's going to last, I believe, twice as long. I mean, the, the Teslas are clearly a million-mile car. And if they're going 10,000 miles or less a year, we've got a long duration car compared to the current fleet. I say you're going to save uh, half the purchases. You're going to save 40 5,000 every year after you cycle in these new cars. I'd like to give that to the police officers. I'd like to give the police officers, officers the $7,000 a year you're going to save per car after the first year and a half of uh, recovering the excess cost. As a taxpayer, I don't want to not go, I don't want to go back to gas, pollute the environment, run those cars which are on idle so much of the time where they are consuming fuel and have that waste going on. I, that's my plea. I think, uh, Mike, when, when the Chief Raquel used to talk about seven, I think it was usually him plus seven. I, I think it was eight that he used to say was the... I, I think that's... that's does, that make, does that sound yeah, right? Oh, right? Yeah, I think that might be right. Further comment? Bill Moore. Um, this is fascinating, first of all, that, that this got brought up and it had a relatively routine discussion about, about the car purchases and whether or not we need to fully fund our police department, the phenomenal police department. The idea of taking away funding on officers and coverage. Uh, I hate to be one of those people, especially since I only moved to town 17 or 18 years ago, you know, but I think you need the history of understanding how the town of Brandon works and how the town decided that we did want this amount of coverage for the, and we were willing to pay for it, and as our successful budgets have, have proven. Uh, and I think if you're looking for more attendance at select board meetings, I think that perhaps this might be a way to generate that by threatening the opportunity to take away our police coverage. We're not looking for attendance in that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'd like to, I think that, I think that at some point that we do need to go electric with some stuff. I think our, I don't believe it right now for the police department. I mean, I think the vehicle that, we, we do have a, a transport vehicle that's used for around. I think when that comes time to replace, that might be a, Opportunity to look at electric. I don't believe it's the right opportunity right now for the police department to to go on to that. And with that being said, I'd like to move on to the next agenda item. Any further comment? Yeah. Um, so we have a diversity of cruisers. I think different kinds for different tasks. We have diversity of opinions on the. Um, most appropriate vehicles. Um, we've got a lot of great information which we appreciate having come from folks attending the meeting by Zoom and here in, in the room and from our own uh, police chief. So thank you for informing us on that. Um, I think that electric police car research just will naturally move into the agenda item that was added, which is the consideration of a cruiser purchase. And uh, Mr. Wyman's asked for us to move that way. So we'll be on item 7A. I don't think any action was actually required on 7 itself. So 7A, um, 
is to consider a police cruiser purchase. What's the pleasure of the board? I'd like to make a motion that we uh, use the chief's recommendation and use go with Keystone's cruiser. Talked about. Motion for Mr. Coolidge is to take the chief's recommendation, which was presented at the last meeting. Right. right. And right. for and the forty-five thousand two hundred and forty-two dollars, ready for the road. Is that an amount not to exceed uh, forty-two thousand two forty-two? Forty-two so, two forty-two. Yeah. Sorry. Forty-two two forty-two. Is that right? Forty-five. Forty-five. Forty-five, 45 two forty-two. Is there a second to Mr. Coolidge's motion? I'll second that. Second from Mr. Markowski. Is there a discussion? Yeah, I'd like to um, to make the suggestion that um, uh, investing in um, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure is um, a, a totally wrong thing to be doing at this day and age. And at the very least, um, we're you know replacing a car with an SUV. And it's a mistake to be um, moving into a larger vehicle um, at this time. Um, and the Energy Committee has come up with um, you know, valid information, um, talked to other police chiefs, other police departments, and shown that the electric car is viable. It's an option. I mean, as we talked as a board in the past, when we were talking about loaders, bucket loaders, and we were talking about other equipment, if there were viable options, we were open to those. And there is a viable option for a police car. And so um, th this is a totally wrong choice to make, to get a gas-powered, larger <coughs> vehicle, when we do not need a seventh vehicle um, in our police force. Well, I'm, I'm going to trust the judgment, our, the judgment of our police chief, who thinks we do, and uh, I don't believe the electric vehicles are there yet. I don't have a doubt they will be at some point, but right now I don't think they're there. So you've heard the Energy Department, the Energy Committee, say that police departments all over the country have Tesla patrol cars, and you're saying they're not ready? And I, I believe our chief also. And I, I also heard the Energy Committee say that the waiting period that we have on it right now would be quite a wait. Six um, months. Uh, <coughs> I think more than six months. No. But, um, could, could I add something to sure. Also, in the report given by the Energy Committee, there, there is a list of four bullets with a caption on the top that says, however, we do not see a need to immediately move forward and the recommendation is to wait a year or two for the following reasons. It lifts off, lists off the four bullet points. And that's a recommendation, I'm assuming, from the Energy Committee. That is their report. Right. My understanding was they suggested not buying any deal. Okay. It, it, it's, not, it's not not buying electric. It's just not I buying understand any that. It, This is... I guess the comment wasn't directed directly towards a EV vehicle here. Right. <clears throat> so. Could I ask Chief Kachajan, uh, thank you for the recommendation you made at the last meeting, and, and I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. Did you receive or did you look at the board packet that was posted and did you, did you uh, read the Energy Committee's report on their research that they did since the last meeting? I did not. The only thing I got for the packet was the agenda. I actually didn't get the other packet for my email today, so I did not have a chance to look at that. Okay, so while, while participating on Zoom, were you able to hear um, what Mr. Schneider was kind of giving the highlights of the Energy Committee research during this meeting this evening? Yes, I did. You did. So um, could I ask, is it still your, does your recommendation remain the same, or does your recommendation change at all after the information that the Energy Committee presented tonight? Uh, my recommendation doesn't change, but that being said, I am 100% committed for our next cruiser to go with an electric vehicle as long as it's a viable option for police work. I understand a lot of agencies have purchased these vehicles. I understand NYPD is going to several of those for their fleets. I understand some departments in Vermont have gone with Teslas, but I need to do what's the best for the police department in this community. And I do not feel right now that 
this is the appropriate choice. But again, that being said, I'm hoping by the time we have to purchase another cruiser down the line that the technology is going to be improved, the prices will come down, because that, I'll, I'll be honest with you too, that's another thing. I don't have the money in my budget to purchase a, an electric vehicle. It, it's just not there. I have a finite amount of money that I was given to purchase this cruiser, and with what it would cost for a Tesla or even a Mach-E, it's going to be over my budget. Uh, and again, I'm trying to be fiscally responsible with these purchases. Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm committed to going green, going with an electric cruiser down the line. But right now, I stand by my, my opinion that we need this um, Port Explorer as our next cruiser. Like I said, hopefully um, things will change the next time we need to purchase a car. And I'm more than willing to look into it. And, and actually, I will give, even give the select board a commitment now that I, I'm, I will um, purchase an electric vehicle again if the, if the vehicle is going to suit the police department's needs. As I said in the last meeting, too, uh, police vehicles are specialty vehicles. Um, all the vehicles, even the Mach-E right now, it is a civilian car. It's not built for police work. Um, every cruiser has um, enhanced suspension safety equipment in them. Even uh, the Tesla, if, if memory serves me, has a glass roof on it. To try to secure a light bar to that could be potentially catastrophic if something happened with the integrity of that uh, roof. And even, even the Mach-E's that a lot of these apartments are going with right now, there's issues with those. Again, even a police um, prisoner transport cage in the back. I personally don't feel comfortable with having a prisoner in the car with me, seatbelted next to me, either behind me, next to me, um, and I wouldn't want my officers to be put in harm's way by having a cruiser that doesn't have a cage in it. Uh, again, hopefully some of these companies will develop cages that fit these cars, but again, the safety of my officers is a priority as well. But like I said, I, I will stick with my decision that I think the Ford Explorer is the appropriate choice at this time, but I will also make that commitment to the select board and the community of Brandon that I'm more than willing to seriously look at an electric vehicle for our next police cruiser when that time comes in the near future. Further comment? Call the question, question. please. Uh, the request to vote. Are you ready to vote? All in favor of um, the motion to purchase a Ford Explorer from G Stone Ford Cruiser not to exceed $45,242. Say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. 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 That's three to two. So that passes. Do you got the two names? I do. Thank you, Charlene. Any post-vote comment? Mm -hmm. Item eight is ARPA discussion then. So there's nothing special in the packet about ARPA discussion, and we did kind of have a little bit of discussion about ARPA already with the solar and talking about, um, you know, ARPA plus local option tax plus bonds and stuff like that. So uh, this was just on here basically as a placeholder for that discussion, but we've kind of already had it. Unless anybody has anything else they'd like to chime in regarding ARPA priorities or funds or things of that nature. Okay, I think we'll just pass over that one for now then and continue the ARPA discussion in that kind of comprehensive way uh, at the next meeting and probably over the next couple of meetings, a few meetings. Item 9, uh, some news from the trustees of public funds regarding their position on funding of mosquito abatement. Uh, so their minutes of April 13th are in the board packet. Um, they have been advised by an attorney <coughs> Um, that the bequest that, con that comprises the bulk of Brandon's public funds, um, the attorney who, av who advised the trustees says that um, they are not designated specifically for mosquito control. The town has relied on the trustees of public funds making a contribution from that fund to the town which does not cover the town's assessment to the Mosquito Control District, but does offset a portion of the town's assessment to the Mosquito Control District. And then in the packet, you'll see um, some 
response from Sue Gage and some research um, that she did regarding the actual bequests that comprises, if, if not the entirety of, at least the bulk of the public fund. Is this the, is it the whole thing? The well, Shirley, is the Shirley Five bequest the whole thing, or is there other bequests that are lumped in there? For trustee of the public funds? No, I think that's it. Yeah, that is it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <coughs> so, um, I guess I asked for this to be on the agenda because um, this is a responsibility of the town is to meet its assessment to the mis to the Otter Creek Watershed in Insect Control District. And I wondered what the board's um, re reaction to this is, if any, or the public. Personally, I'm inclined to test this a little bit because I don't think that the advice um, or the analysis provided to the trustees is how I necessarily would have analyzed the bequest. I think um, in that first page of the, the long typewritten section, you know, it talks about the bequest is for primarily for proper sewage disposal. This is from Shirley Farr's bequest to the town. Drainage of swamps, other sanitary improvements, so on and so forth, spraying of trees, um, and I think that in 1960 or in the 50s when she probably devised the will, I think that drainage of swamps and spraying of trees was <coughs> how we controlled insects. So I tend to think that while the word mosquito or insect does not appear, I tend to think that the effect of draining swamps and spraying trees would have been to control insects. And that she, she meaning Shirley Farr, served um, for quite a long time on a citizens committee trying to control insects in this town and mitigate their ill effects on living here. And so I, I would like us to um, enter into a conversation with the trustees at least. Um, maybe we could ask the town manager as our negotiator of contracts and things of that nature. Would that be an appropriate thing um, if you had the board's um, request to do that? Is that something you could do with the trustees? Or is that something you're not comfortable doing with trustees? I'm fine with that. I would make a suggestion that maybe have a conversation with our town attorney to fill her in on what's yeah. taking place here. Yeah. Um, first, I think we do, if you guys yeah. are okay with that. Sense of the board, any objection? That's a good idea. Okay, any public input on this? Mosquitoes, funding of mosquito control, things of that nature? I, one, one comment I have, so, so yeah. I, I think if we're looking at you know what it implies, like this, they, the trustees of public funds have funded a certain portion of the mosquito control for quite some time. I mean, it's it's pretty much implied that they didn't have a problem with doing it based on the language that was in Shirley Farr's will to to use for us to request money for this. So, I'm not really sure why the interpretation the, the interpretation changed. Interpretation changed this year yeah. over. Uh, I saw a long time Brandon resident draw in a breath as if he was about to make a statement. I was going to say I'm anti mosquito. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> Bernie Carr, did you have uh, something to enlighten us? Well, it sounds like maybe the current board has been, they themselves, taken a different view on what the money can or can't be used for. But I, I, I'm glad you read that thing about Shirley Farr. I was just saying the bill that was for sanitation, public health, and public, you know, general welfare of the, of the Brandon community and quality of life. And it definitely is there. So if this was to happen, it was to be moved out of these trustee public funds. Those funds can be put to use for something else. That's fine. But they, it, that money has to come from somewhere. So it's, uh, it would go into the, I assume it would go into the taxpayers' backs to do it. And I can guarantee you that Every taxpayer, um, they feel strong about the police department, they feel strongly about the mosquitoes because for that stretch of t time, it was the worst probably five to eight years I've ever experienced in the town of Brandon. Our quality of life was almost down to zero. We'd use a full can of off 
to spray our Little League teams per game. <laughs> that is not good. And you talk about spraying trees and, and uh, things like that she talked about. They were probably spraying with DDT. Uh, right. The, the, the swamps, I think the old graybeards used to say the swamps, they would pour kerosene into the swamps to take care of larvae. Um, this is a significant improvement to anything and money well spent for the welfare of the, of the citizens of the town of Brandon. Um, if they feel it's not appropriate for, for their, their particular funds to be used that way, um, all I'm saying is it needs to be taken care of in some way. There seems to be this backlash against the Mosquito Control District, and it's, it's dangerous, literally dangerous. Pete Green lost his dad to, to double E disease, triple E disease, whatever it was called, and someone else passed away over in Sudbury. And I mean, so we, we know what can happen with this. Um, whatever re the result is, we can't let this Mosquito District somehow be reduced. Um, a high priority for our village, for our town. We can't have a great village. I've been bit twice tonight. <laughs> I was right on my yard tonight, so they're out and around. And I, I entirely agree, Bernie, and I think if you've been part of any of the budget workshops when the Insect Control District has come to let us know what the assessment looks like it's going to be and so forth, I think you would have heard you know, really full-throated support from the select board. Um, my concern is not that the select board is wavering in its support of the Mosquito District at all. Oh, it's no. that um, the terms of the bequest be honored. And I think that in the, the new interpretation to me doesn't seem to be the plain reading of how, how the language appears to me to be. Okay. As, a, as a lay person, neither well versed in scientific matters of insect control or the law. But Nevertheless, elected every year for the last eight years. <laughs> people of this town. All right, so we have a plan. You're going to go talk to the town attorney and see if uh, you can talk to the trustees. Awesome. Thank you. Item 10 is the warrant. Is there a motion on the board? Oh, my second motion. Sorry. So the motion is to approve the warrant as it's before us, $106,887.02. Any questions on the bills? Public input before we sign them? If not, ready to vote. All in favor of approval of the warrant as it was presented to the board, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? Is that unanimous? Yes, I think so. Unanimous. Very good. Okay, so we have an executive session, uh, which we'll do, but are there any announcements that anyone would like to make for the good of the community before we recess for the executive session? Okay, if not, thank you all for being part of the meeting tonight.